Welcome back everyone to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill and by popular demand, I am delighted today to be able to speak to Andrew Lister of Aberdeen Standard Investments, one of the smartest investors in emerging markets. So welcome, Andrew. Morning, Paul. Um, Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problems. Um, now, big picture wise, we've had a bit of wobble over the last three weeks on Wall Street, largely sort of fears over rising bond yields on 10 year treasuries. Um, what's your sort of view on equities, but specifically the sweet spot of emerging markets going forward? Uh, so I'd say our view overall is, is generally quite positive. Um, yeah, I think you, you're right to categorise it as a, as a bit of a wobble in the last three weeks. But yeah. if you look where we've come from, um, you know, it's not surprising. Uh, markets can't just go up in a straight line indefinitely. Um, so some, some validity to some of the concerns that have been driving that kind of back up in, in yields. Um, and obviously, it's had a, an impact on, on emerging markets to some degree. But I think what's really interesting is you know, yields have been rising pretty much since last August. And actually, since that time, I think, I think the US 10-year, which you referred to, probably hit a low of about 50 basis points. That's correct. Um, you know, since that time, that yield has been rising in emerging market equities have actually been outperforming. Mm. So I think quite often we find that you know, assumptions people make about emerging markets don't necessarily play out in reality. Yeah. So yeah, actually, it's been, it's been a great time to be in, in EM equities since those yields have been rising. You've had a lot of outperformance of developed market equities. Um, and that's possibly, you know, surprising to some people, but it's not, it's not surprising to us because um, these things tend to happen when everybody uh, expects markets to behave one way. Uh, you know, they have a tendency to surprise in the opposite direction. Way, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think also is you've got to ask why the yield is rising. And largely, I mean, just from, from my sort of layman's take, it's because of the economy is going to be stronger going forward. We're expecting a big rebound in 2021 yeah. in emerging markets and likewise in 2022. We've got vaccination programs. So this is just a logical scenario whereby you're getting increasing nominal growth and real growth and higher inflation. And therefore, it's actually investors shouldn't get spooked. They should get almost comforted that the market is telling them that the economic rebound is actually happening, presumably. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. So it's, it's a very positive reason. And I think, um, you know, that's one of the reasons I think people continue to view there as being a very little alternative yeah. except for equities globally, yeah. uh, based on this reflation trade, but also, you know, low rates are staying low. The, the good news is that despite the fact we have had those rates doubling, uh, you know, backing up a bit, then, uh, you know, the central banks haven't come out and said, yeah, we need to change something. You know, we're still going to have low rates from central banks around the world for the foreseeable future, certainly for the next couple of years. Um, and that's a very, very positive backdrop for equities. Yeah. And I think when uh, people, you know, look around the world as to where they want to put their next marginal dollar or pound of equity exposure, every person who does that, I think, is going to alight on emerging markets as actually, look, here, here's somewhere that's got quite a lot going for it at the moment. Um, yes, they performed well over the very short term, um, but actually longer term, if you look over the last 10 years, you know, there's there's large, large swathes of emerging market equities that have done very, very little. And I mean almost nothing. Yeah. Um, and if you look really hard, you can find some very, very contrarian corners of the universe that have gone backwards in the last 10 years, despite, you know, what we would say are really quite good fundamentals. So really given that, for anyone looking, you know, for something to allocate to where valuations are sensible, where you can get exposure to good companies, um, and, and all importantly, in currencies now um, that, you know, with a dollar moderating, you're not going to have this constant headwind that we've had in the last you know, decade of, for, for markets like South Africa, Brazil, Russia, Mexico, um, where you're constantly battling against a weakening currency. Then, you know, we think emerging markets are a logical place for people to put some, some incremental cash. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly highlight to investors, <laughs> have a look at your fund, the Aberdeen Emerging Markets Investment Company, because I was just having a quick, I just got the screen up this morning. And I was frankly gobsmacked because over the last 20 years, the FTSE has gone two and a half percent up. So it's gone nowhere. The S&P 500 is 175%. The Nasdaq's on 365%. But, but the emerging markets, Aberdeen Emerging Markets is up 
420%. I mean, you've absolutely knocked the ball out of the park compared to every single major developed market, including NASDAQ. So uh, it's sort of like tells a, a story, doesn't it, I guess? Yeah, no, I, I think it does. And, you know, we what we're always saying to investors is that that's that those are past performance numbers. So, you know, they're fabulous. But, okay. um, you know, past performance is no guide to future yeah, performance. Sure. But actually, you know, we don't see any reason why the kind of 10 to 12% annualized returns you've had from emerging market equities over the last 20 or 30 years. Mm. Um, we don't see any reason why that can't continue um, because a lot of the things in place that have driven that performance are still in place today. You know, you've yeah. still got a, a massive universe that's very inefficient uh, in a large number of countries, which are generally growing very quickly with a growing number of corporates listed on exchange um, for you to pick from uh, for our underlying managers to select from. Um, and, you know, even, even bigger picture than that, it's still an asset class that's driven very much by emotion. So, you know, those that 20 years has included four, five, six, ten, you know, negative episodes um, where there's been very bad headlines um, around a single market or a reason or something that's happened to the dollar or rates or politics um, you know, you name it, emerging markets have been through most of it. And, and people do tend to take flight uh, from the asset class back to kind of safe havens. And, and over that 20 year period, each one of those episodes has been a fantastic buying opportunity. So, um, yeah, it's a great asset class to be an active manager. And um, we don't see any reason why, um, you know, those kind of returns can't. Yeah, can't I, I did actually see that the. You know, the volatility, as long as you've got a long term view, the volatility is obviously bigger than it is in, you know, sort of like uh, bigger changes up and down compared at certain times compared to the d developed markets. But I'm guessing going forward, because of the liquidity in terms of currency exchanges and opening up of emerging markets, then it may be that the emerging market sort of like uh, standard deviation, the level of volatility on it should actually, in theory, decrease going forward and you'll still get. The performance, but you won't get the vol. You won't get as much volatility, presumably. Yeah, I don't. I don't know That's about the logic. That because, I guess. Yeah, I don't know about the logic because the the liquidity could be double edged. Right. You know, the, okay. the fact that you can get money into a market very quickly means that you can also take it out very quickly. Yeah. Okay. But certainly, from a from a capital market standpoint, you know, equity markets bigger, more liquid, more diverse. Uh, bond markets, you know, infinitely bigger, more liquid, more diverse than they were. So definitely the asset class has matured in, in terms of capital markets. We should take out um, the illiquidity premium anyway. It should, yeah. You know, it, def it definitely should. And if you yeah. go back 20 years, you know, liquidity was it's night and day compared yeah, to, yeah. to how today. Big, so. How big is the emerging markets? I mean, I saw a chart on, I don't know whether it's true or not, but of the total global equity market, it's about 25, 30% of total sort of like um, market cap. Is, is that about right? I mean, is it? Yeah, so um, it depends on who you look at, but but it's, it's much bigger than people think is the answer. Yeah. So I think total market cap of the MSCI emerging markets is in the region of eight to nine trillion dollars. Yes. So it's, it's a big asset class. The weighting of emerging markets in a global equity benchmark would be something in the region of kind of 10 to 12%. Yeah. Um, people are generally very under allocated. So, you know, investors we speak to are generally surprised to hear that. Mm. So that's in addition to, you know, forget anything that you own in the FTSE that you think is emerging markets. This is yeah. direct uh, exposure to those local exchanges. Mm. Um, but, you know, if you, if you look at emerging markets in any other way, so by population or by percentage of global GDP, if you look at it by percentage of GDP growth, it's, it's embarrassing uh, for developed markets because I think it's, it's now getting on for kind of two thirds um, of the global growth in GDP yes. comes from emerging markets. Yeah, so arguably, you know, we would always we would always say, and for me, my personal account is significantly more than that 12 percent or 10 to 12 percent that you get from only kind of the index weight in emerging markets. So, yeah. um, you know, 20 years ago, it was an optional asset allocation call, I would say, you know, versus today, it's it's a must have. You've got to have some emerging markets in your portfolio. If you if you run a diversified portfolio, then, you know, it's got to contain emerging market equities and probably emerging market bonds as well. 
Yeah, I mean, and, that's not- tr- and that should be true whether you're a retail investor or an institutional investor. You know, everything from uh, someone self self directed all the way up to a sovereign wealth fund. It should it should be it should have some exposure to emerging markets. I think. Well, I, I feel as though my wrists have been slapped then in that case because I'm a sort of like a, I'm a professional investor who's been putting my own money to work for thirty years. But I I have to you know, admit that I'm sort of like you know I've had this home bias sort of like problem. I, I go for a developed markets and really haven't. I've missed the the upside in in emerging markets. But certainly in terms of you know your your MSSI um, sort of like percentage, if it is sort of like you know I don't know ten percent of the total MSSI index then i think that shows you that there's actually a lot of stocks and indices that you can't access as a retail investor because i think if you take as a total basket they just you know things like china a shares nobody can buy them it really is tough but going forward those opportunities you'll get more state enterprises listed which presumably for a fund like yourself with that level of expertise and I can't access those markets, but given those things, when they do open, it will give you the first sort of like look to be able to access those opportunities. I mean, it reminds me very much of Sid the Investor back in the 80s, when they just government just gave away the likes of BT and British Gas, yeah. and all these kind of things. And the same thing will happen if you're if you're ahead of the queue, which is a, presumably the Aberdeen in the, um, Emerging Market Fund, those opportunities will come first to you guys, I guess. Yeah, I mean, they, they should come to us, um, but also you know, we're, so we're a fund of funds. So we're, we're using yes. lo- locally based managers. Yeah. So all important, you know, I think even if you are an, a big EM investor, you know, you're still going to have people on the ground in each of these markets. who have got a slight edge over you. Mm. So, for example, you know, if you're if you're looking at somewhere like the Middle East, uh, where we have allocations, you know, that those markets have only recently been opening up. Yeah, you've had to you've had to be front of the queue for your for your queue fee. You know, your qualifying foreign yeah. investor. You know, you get very few people um, who get you know granted those mm-hmm. kind of allocations, um, and it usually indicates that yeah, you're in you're in at the at the ground floor, um, and that's exactly the kind of thing we like, and it's exactly the way we build our portfolio in the hope that you know investors um, see us as a one stop shop to. You know, the best of what's available in in emerging markets, and and I would agree. A lot of you, know, you can you can access some of it, um, but I think you know the, the the best route into most of these markets is going to be through a collective of some sort, open ended, closed ended. You know, our preference is to hold some of both, um, but you know, it's it's uh, it's fortunate for, for investors in the UK. You know, there's a lot of options. Ours is obviously one of them, but there are. Um, you know, now we've got 35 years of history in emerging market equities. You know, there's a good number of managers that you can outsource to. And our preference is just to go for, uh, you know, really um, diehard locals who are very, very ingrained in a single market or a single region who can really, you know, bring that focus to bear on you know, hidden gems, and you, and uncovering you, you those the whip, stocks. You, you yeah, crack the whip, it, hold their feet to the fire, presumably. Yeah, because as we it's said, it's a, huge, be. it's a huge asset class. And, yeah, no, you know, agree, but, yeah. but, but, but across the asset class, we see the same kind of uh, excitement from our underlying managers for the same kind of things, which is finding those companies, small and mid caps, less well covered by the analyst community that are going to be the champions of, of tomorrow. So if you look at our portfolio as a whole, we're actually very underweight. The very large caps that have come to dominate the index, which are all the big tech companies, yeah, um, you know, th- those have been the, the drivers of performance. A lot of the performance in in the index in the last five or six years, because that's been the absolutely the hottest theme. Mm. Um, but you know, our style of investing is quite contrarian. So whilst we've been delighted to hold some of that, although we've been underweight, you know, we get a lot more excited about what's been discarded. You know, at the other end of the spectrum where people are throwing assets away at, at totally the wrong prices because they've performed poorly, because they're not in fashion, because uh, they're illiquid. Um, you know, so you know, we, we don't see um, the entire emerging story being about technology uh, and, in, and, and internet stocks and gaming stocks and some of the stuff that's really, really popular at the moment. Yeah. You know, we, we're giving a much broader... Uh, diversified basket, you know, everything from those kind of companies down to, you know, breweries in Kenya um, <laughs> or, or mining companies in, in, in Latin America or, yeah. or energy companies in Russia. So, yeah. you know, 
uh, I think you, you you get rewarded in the long term for taking um, a diversified approach to yeah. this to yeah. this asset class. A calculated risk, basically. I mean, exactly. I'll, yeah. yeah, yeah. I would definitely say to investors. I mean, I say it's very difficult to get into emerging markets direct. I mean, how how could I buy you know sort of shares in an Indian company in a you know, sort of like a Chinese business or in a you yeah. know South American firm, it'd be impossible. So, you know, if you are interested, yeah. in going- and, e- and even if you could, uh, you know, how confident would you be that you've done enough research on a you know a direct Indian stock versus all the other Indian stocks? I mean, India is a good example because there's literally thousands of listed stocks. Exactly. I mean, yeah. so as a so as a self-directed investor, the, the chances of you picking the best Indian possible. stock out of the thousands that exist there. Yeah. Um, you know, and we see this quite often that, you know, the biggest markets with the most companies listed um, are, the, are, the, are the ones where your locally based managers generate the best relative sure. returns Yeah. Okay. because the universe is just so big. So you mentioned China A share earlier, and that's another one. That's a huge universe of companies. I did notice and, China, and, China's 40 percent of your holding, isn't it? Instead of like uh, which I think is a, is, 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 a, is a sort of like just a normal neutral weight compared to the sort of the emerging market index. Yeah. It? So so we've got so we've got about 30. We've actually got about 33 percent in China. Oh, you're under and, it, and it's and it's 40 percent of the benchmark. Oh, okay. And we've got about 4% of our 33 is in Chinese bonds. So we're actually quite underweight China equities. Oh, okay. Um, we're very overweight A shares. Um, and then we're underweight the mainland exchanges. So the A share market, as I said, you know, excites us because firstly, we can access it through an in-house fund. So we do is, like... Is that, the, just, for, just for investors, A, A, A shares is on Hong Kong, is it? And H shares are on in the mainland or is it the other way around it's, it's the other way around so the yeah. a, a share is the domestic market where the yeah. local investors can play so it can be quite uh speculative yes you know you've got i'd say it's the less institutional of the markets therefore and you've got a, a, a range in quality of companies from yeah you know absolute dross um being punted about by by locals who treat the market a little bit like a, a casino yeah. Yeah. all the way up to genuine really good high quality Chinese corporates yeah, okay. and so for your active manager just looking at a shares you know if you can build a portfolio of 40 or 50 of the highest quality companies there at sensible valuations then you know, you've got a you've got a really really good chance of absolutely yeah. you know you, you and how do you generating think- really good performance relative to the broader market yeah. and how do you think China and sort of America will sort of like uh, pan out because obviously Trump's now not in the White House and he was throwing rocks at China and Beijing but it does seem as though Biden's holding his line and I spoke to Martin Gilbert actually just about three or four months ago and he was sort of like a bit pessimistic in terms of actually having a detente in terms of a trade agreement because he thought Biden and some of the security guys were actually going to t- continue taking a tough line on the technology. How, how do you think it's going to pan out? Yeah, I, I mean, we we don't think we were we were pleased when Biden, you know, got into the White House. Um, <laughs> really? Not yeah, not because not because we were expecting any any great change to the policy towards China, but because it should just become a bit more orthodox. So I think Best tweets. I think the the means the means will become more orthodox, but I think the general policy was was you know is going to continue. So I don't think we see um, that being rolled back. Uh, I think obviously Biden has probably got you know enough on his plate domestically um, that it's probably not top of his list. Yeah. But you know we've seen the measures recently where they've they've, they've uh, prompted the delisting. That was kind of a you know a mm. legacy of, of the Trump administration. But yeah. um, certainly it wasn't SEC repealed. The delisting of Chinese stocks of some of them yeah, that meet yeah. the audit requirements. Yeah. So that that's had a short term impact on some of the stocks in question because obviously you know prompted some some forced selling or some motivated selling um, out of funds that needed to become compliant because they had US shareholders. Um, but, you know, I, I think people underestimate um, the relative importance of local investors versus international investors in, in most emerging markets, actually. Yeah. So, you know, long term local investors are the main driver of local markets and foreign investors, um, you know, tend to kind of come and go. Uh, a bit like tourists, you know, as in when things are nice, and uh, and then they leave when they're not so nice. So we see we see the main driver being local investors, yeah, um, and that's true in China as anywhere else. But certainly China is opening up to foreigners. This is a little bit of a speed bump 
um but we don't we don't think it's you know going to have a material impact is it, uh, it might just change that it'll it'll just change the dynamics of you know yeah. the ipo market for for the china i mean uh, you had um president z i think saying only this morning or yesterday i can't remember exactly what it was but uh I mean, he's on the mission now to become self-sufficient in silicon chips and technology for China. So you could actually see that it becomes a sort of like a, another Silicon Valley in China because they're rather than actually outsourcing this technology and, and, and buying it from the, from the US, they just do an absolute, they just, just pile masses and masses of effort and time and yeah. money into it. And therefore, yeah. you could, it, be, it could become another real sort of growth driver, presumably for China, I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, technology is al is already pretty big. Um, and, and obviously, if you look at Greater China, you've got Taiwan, which has got, you know, been a market that's performing phenomenally um, based on, you know, demand for um, for chips and, and, yeah. and other kind of tech related hardware. Um, so Apple, really, the, for instance, need, need, need Taiwan. Yeah. To don't like so, so I think what's yeah, I mean, what's really interesting in the last couple of years is you've had you've had the. Um, you know, you've had the trade war between China and, and the US. That's obviously changed um, we've still got that the relationship. In place, haven't we? We've still got the tariffs in place, but they yep. could be made, uh, you know, you never know. Those might start to be rolled back at some point in time. Yep. Yeah. No, you're quite right. And then we've had COVID, which is, you know, the initial stage of COVID was everybody redrawing their, their um, you know, their plans for where they source, you know, most of the stuff that's made in the world. Yes. Is it going to come from China still if, um, you know, if China was proven to be the source of the virus in the first place and there's more sanctions going to be put in and, and, and the US is generally going to ratchet things up. So in terms of kind of production, global production, um, I think you're quite right. The lines will be redrawn. Um, China is um, keen to be self-sufficient in most things, you know, including resources. Um, so it's very interesting how trade patterns are going to change between emerging markets, between each other and then the US. Yeah. So we don't think you know, it's been our, our stance um, as a team um, throughout the kind of US-China trade war that China is actually a, in a pretty strong position. I think the, mm. the perception is that US is, you know, absolutely dominant and can define the terms to China. But actually, you know, China has a lot going for it and so far has pushed back pretty aggressively on the US and I think will continue to do so. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, they, the things they have going for them is huge technology capability, particularly in that, in that standpoint. I mean, these are world-class companies that are, mm. that are listing in China and performing now. Um, but also the political setup, you know, we, I'm sure you'll have questions for me later on about political risk and such like. Yeah, well, come on, Zach, um, a moment. And, you know, and China's a pretty obvious one where, you know, you still have a communist state. Um, but, you know, the, you saw through COVID, there are benefits to that as well as, Obviously, we we in the West would point and say that's you know that's um, inferior to democracy. But actually, through COVID, you know, you saw that the, the massive benefits of that are that um, you know you can you can affect change very quickly. You can implement very quickly, and you don't have to worry as much about your you know where you are in your electoral cycle. Yeah. Um, if you've got a midterm coming up or anything like that, you can you can affect change very quickly, knowing that you are you know the the one party. Um, and you've got a very, you can take a very long term view on these things. Yeah. And if you just, I mean, just, we'll just knock that one on the head in terms of if, if it's sort of like five or 10 years time that China did unravel a bit like obviously the Iron Curtain, for instance, it probably, I mean, I don't know, but I think most investors would, would say it's going to unravel a bit like Russia, i.e. such that it was, wasn't a war. It didn't create massive disturbance. It was just a natural breakup if that ever does happen as a long shot. I mean, we, we're nowhere near it anyway that they move towards uh, democracy. But if they, if, if President Z ever decided, you know, it was actually changed and they got somebody who was a bit more, then it, it probably wouldn't be a may. It'd be a big event. Don't get me wrong. I'm not dissing it, but it would it, it would probably it wouldn't be a negative. It wouldn't necessarily be a negative event. It could actually be a positive event if it was actually opening it up and became a, you know, sort of like a more open democracy um, along the lines of Russia anyway. So if you're in if you're in that investment, I mean, if you look at the if you look at Russia, what happened in, when that opened up? I mean, as soon as it turned, I mean, you made unbelievably good returns because yeah. the economy just absolutely was jumpstart. So it's again, it's been in that that position early, I guess, really, isn't it? Well, with with, yeah. with, with, um, with ESG now, how do you actually sort of like square the circle in terms of the S part of ESG 
and Hong Kong and these kind of guys. You have to. How, how does the how does a fund manager like yourself sort of like um, give that corporate view into the fund managers that you you manage? Um, so I'd say I'd say it's very challenging. I mean the the <laughs> e and the, the e and the g is is a lot more um, yeah. simple. Yes. Um, and and tangible. Yes. Uh, and so I think it's. Um, you know, it's something that we obviously do discuss with our underlying managers. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's challenging to influence overall country level, yeah. um, you know, policy yeah. and, and, and political structure. Yeah. And I think the view we would take is that if you if you really, um, you know, don't like uh, a regime, for example, that is in place in a country, you know, you should you just shouldn't invest there. And that's something that we can direct ourselves. Yeah. Um, but you know we have invested pretty broadly across all emerging markets, and I think as you, as you just said with Russia, you know it's um, you, you you quite often stand to make the most money when you have these changes. So you know we've invested everywhere from um, you know we've invested in Argentina, we've invested in Zimbabwe, um, and you know foreign capital can be a source for for great good at those kind of moments of change. Yeah. probably a lot more played out through through debt markets um you know through in conjunction with the likes of the IMF and such like who are generally involved in in situations like that um but yeah the answer is we could we can do everything we, we do everything we can but it's not necessarily easy to affect political change as an equity investor yeah. I mean what you can do is certainly avoid any companies that have any ties back to um you know, a regime or a political party that is, you know, doing the wrong thing by its by its population. Yeah, and just just on the COVID, sort of the reopening, etc. I mean, just actually, first of all, have you been able to get out? You've been able to get sort of like get to speak to your local fund managers over the last twelve. Yeah, months. been obviously well, a like, challenge for you, I imagine. I'd say we've spoken to them more in the last twelve months yeah, than okay. in the previous three years, because um, and and you know, as a, a positive is that. I think we will be spending, we will have a smaller carbon footprint, you know, after yes. this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we won't necessarily be jumping on the, on, a, on a plane to Cape Town to do three meetings um, or to Rio to do half a dozen meetings. You know, we, we've had a lot of interaction with our managers and we have been quizzing them on, you know, how they've been due dil- continuing due diligence on their portfolio companies. And, and the answers have, have generally been, you know, it's been fine. Yeah, um, it's been very, very workable. Not to say that people wouldn't prefer to do face to face, but um, I think it's it's been working okay on that front through the powers of technology. Yeah, just just on the on sort of COVID reopening. Now, you, you mentioned a very good point in terms of you know China with its sort of like um, political re, you know regime was managed to managed to impose. I think I think originally it locked down seventy six million people in Wuhan, didn't it? So yeah, that's that's over. That's bigger than the population of the UK. So that was sort of like a good start of a one. But they're the only major G seven economy that actually showed positive growth last year, which is just simply you know given that the UK was down ten percent and most of. Europe was ten was five to ten percent, so it just shows you how effective it was. But going forward, sort of like looking, I mean, there was a note which came out from Goldman Sachs, and you probably saw it as well. But was talking about when economies get to the fifty percent herd immunity level, and, and amazingly enough, the UK here is actually should, be, according to them, is going to hit it by sort of April May time, and then the US is quickly afterwards. China was sort of October September October. But then you had quite a few sort of tail parts of the emerging markets with 2022, like India and these kind of guys and Thailand. But but those the the frontier markets were 2023 if if they're going to get it, you know. So how, how do you see that reopening and where you does that change your investment lens? Yeah, so I think the interesting thing is if you look at the performance over the last year, it's mm. pretty much exactly in line with the you know the markets that have done well. Are the markets that had a good COVID experience, by which I mean short, sharp lockdowns early on and have come through it very quickly. So as you say, China, China will print a positive GDP number, having had a very short, sharp contraction, mm. um, and then a relatively nor, you know, a relatively quick recovery to normal. Mm. Uh, Korea has done very similar. Taiwan has done very similar. I think you know, those those three, luckily for emerging market investors, those three make up about sixty to seventy percent of the the yeah. benchmark. So that's really helped performance of the asset class. Um, and then the second category would be you know kind of everything else. Um, 
but we do think there's potential for positive surprises in in some of the other markets. So, for example, India, you mentioned, you know, I think we think actually we've been adding to India. Uh, one of the reasons being that the initial uh, very aggressive and quite drawn out lockdown is now being uh, replaced with optimism that actually, as a country, India has got a great vaccine program. The you know, it's got a world, lot of experience, it? yeah, so, and, and a huge farmer and a huge generic yeah. farmer industry. So, you know, they shouldn't have any problem producing, despite the fact they've got you know one of the biggest populations in the world. Um, they shouldn't have a problem producing the vaccine and distributing it. And, and we're hopeful, therefore, that India's 2021 GDP growth, the last number I saw was into double digits. So Double digits for 2021? Double, double digits for 2021. Wow. Um, so a very, a very sharp rebound. And I think something that's underestimated uh, in, in emerging markets in relation to COVID is just that, you know, if you think of, if you think of the, the downsides of emerging markets or, the, or the, you know, the relatively less developed nature of them in terms of healthcare and such like, it really means that actually, you know, if you take Africa as an extreme example, the population of Africa is used to a fair amount of hardship. Mm. So, so whilst this has really knocked us for six in, in the UK because it's totally alien to us, in, in Africa, populations are pretty used to dealing with you know, some pretty unpleasant stuff well, going Ebola on in their countries, it. Whether, it, whether it be Ebola or whether it just be, yeah. you know, uh, a bit of political persecution yeah. or, you know, generally low, um, you know, Harsh conditions. harsher conditions. So it's really, it's really not been taken as a bigger deal in Africa, where also just in terms of, you know, if you look at GDP per capita of places like Egypt or Kenya or Nigeria, you know, the vast majority of those populations don't have a choice but to carry on work. Mm. So it hasn't really been an option for them to, you know, be furloughed and sit at home. Mm. So in, in a lot of emerging markets, we get the impression that actually the impact, both psychologically and in terms of uh, movement of people, has, has not been um, as great as you might think. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we do see in aggregate emerging markets bouncing back and, and growing quite a bit faster than developed markets as a whole mm. um, because they're going to recover quicker, wh whether they've got the vaccine or not. I think because yeah. you know, if you don't have the choice to go into lockdown and stay in lockdown indefinitely until it clears, then you know, you're obviously having less of an impact um, on, on your GDP and your, your ability to work and willingness to work and such like. Yeah, I think that's an important point for investors because... Uh, I mean, I've heard many a time that the work ethic generally in emerging markets, particularly in Asia, I mean, guys are just absolutely laser focused in achievement and their kids are. I mean, you just see it in the schools and stuff in yep. the education system um, that, you know, you, you got to turn the clock back to when we came out of the war, essentially, in, to, in, in, in 45, that, you know, we, everybody was really hungry and really wanted to, 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 to achieve and the states back in the sort of the, the start of the 19th century when they sort of outperformed. And I think the emerging markets has got the same sort of thing that if you've got people who are massively motivated to achieve for themselves and for their families and, and children, then overall the population and GDP should do pretty well and they'll find a way, I guess. Just one, one thing on, the, on COVID, which is actually a sort of like a nuance that seems to have appeared. You've, I mean, it isn't by coincidence that we've got these horrible mutations which have come from Brazil and from South Africa, largely because of their populations having a higher density of compromised immune systems. South Africa having AIDS, where people yeah. have got the weakened immune systems, and Brazil, unfortunately, where a lot of them actually, you know, the Amazonian rainforests, have, they've never really been exposed to the common cold, never mind to COVID, and therefore it's acted as an incubation place for, um, for these you know, horrible and you know, variants and mutations. You could, is that changing your sort of like investment lens of places like South Africa and, 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 and uh, you know, the, this, uh, Brazil? Because Brazil's really struggling still. It's got 80% of its hospitals still, you know, absolutely yeah. packed, jammed with people with, with COVID. Yeah, Brazil Brazil's, um, does look like a kind of weak, a weaker yeah you know, economy, weaker market outlook, still got plenty of politics going on there in the background, not helped by COVID. Mm. Didn't deal with it well to start with, isn't dealing with it particularly well now. 
Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we don't have a huge exposure to Brazil at the moment. And those would be amongst the reasons, you know, the more, more so because we don't see a huge amount of value in Brazilian equities. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we think it's one of those markets that, that still, you know, hasn't, hasn't quite grown up like some of the Asian markets, mm. um, you know, still struggles from some of the typical emerging market issues. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's not somewhere we've got a huge amount of capital at the moment. And if anything, we're probably likely to have less there going forward than, yeah. than other such places. So if you're so the- it's, it's, but it's amazing because it's such a diverse universe. So you know, we, we look at somewhere like Brazil and we're not excited. We look at somewhere like Russia and we're very excited. And you could argue that, well, Russia and Brazil kind of look similar, right? They're, kind they're, they're of in big, bricks. Big old, big, they're in the bricks and they're big old dirty, uh, you know, oil and gas plays, commodity yeah. plays. Surely they're in the same place, roughly. And, and they're not. They're actually in completely different places. So Russia's one of our bigger overweights. And why, um, do you like, why specifically do you like um, sort of like Putin? <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't, well... I wouldn't say we like Putin. No, I, I was joking. We dislike, I, I didn't say we dislike him either. I mean, it's, it's, it's not dissimilar to the situation you've got in China. You might not like the political regime. Yes. You, might want, you might not want to be uh, living under that regime yourself. Um, but Putin, uh, you know, has certainly been a relatively um, benign force of late. Mm. Uh, you know, obviously, there's always some controversy going in, uh, uh, going on in Russia. You know, it could be hacking, or it could be Navalny, or it could be. They've got a lot of technology there. There's always something, but but when if you if you can look past that, and, and I wouldn't say you don't ignore it, mm. but you know, our approach is to say, is it reflected in valuations? And the answer is, oh yeah, it's it's mm. it's more very than very than adequately than reflected in valuations. Yeah. Um, if you look past that, you've got Russia sitting there with high commodity prices high energy prices an undervalued ruble which means that the you know the ruble prices they're receiving for their commodity and energy exports is is, is huge uh that's been the case for a while uh and so you know forget about russia defaulting 98 because you know balance sheets were uh unsustainable you're now talking about a country that's got you know triple surpluses um a very strong sovereign balance sheet the currency is undervalued as i say despite that um, and it's really can only be explained by the sanctions and some of those negative perceptions and headlines. But if you look at the equity universe in Russia, you know, we find it really exciting because it's it's firstly it's it's very good value. I mean, it's the highest yielding emerging market with a with a yield of close to ten percent. Um, and that's that's not just because um, it's undervalued. It's it's because there has been a governance drive in Russia um, to see more. Um, cash distributed to investors, yeah. uh, and and the the, you know, the uptick in retail participation in the Russian market. So this is normal Russians, increasing levels of wealth, opening a stock exchange account for the first time. You don't get the return on Russian bonds you used to. You know when it used to be 15, 16 percent on Russian bonds. This is something that you see across emerging markets now. Um, bond yields have obviously come down a lot. What are so they buying bond equities in the state in, in sort of Russia then compared to the dividend? If you get a dividend yield of nearly ten percent, the bonds are what sort of like I don't know, five, slightly slightly lower. Five, yeah. lower. Okay, yeah. So you get a yeah. higher yield. I, cu- I couldn't give you a, I couldn't give you an exact number off the top of my head, but they're they're now lower than the equity um, yeah. yields. So um, you know the government kind of uh, you, you you have to have if you've got normal Russians investing their hard earned capital in your company, you've got yet another reason to be better. Uh, managed and have stronger governance than you than you have in the past. Yeah, uh, you know, we had the same with Korea until a couple of years ago, and still to the to this day, Korea is perceived as being a market with lower governance standards than than some of the other Asian markets. Um, but that hasn't stopped it performing extremely well. I mean, it's been a phenomenal performer in the last year for us. Yeah, um, and our managers there again have outperformed massively in the last in the last year through just active stock picking. In a market that um, been overlooked for a very long time. Mm. What about? I've heard a lot about Vietnam as being the sort of like the manufacturing basket, or upcoming manufacturing basket of sort of like uh, of Asia, because you've got the likes of Apple, and I think you've had Foxconn, and I think you've also had some of the other tech boys deciding to put put a big manufacturing uh, locations there. So it seems to be getting a lot of serious trade and industrial money and investment, which says to me, actually, in that case. 
I mean, you know, the economy should do pretty well because you're upskilling the workforce, you're bringing new tech into it, you're creating jobs and you're creating intellectual property. Yeah, it's it's a fairly classic frontier market, yeah. um, you know, that wasn't, it is come and gone and in and out of favour probably two or three times in the mm. period we've been running this this fund. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's 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 the kind of thing we do. Like, we don't own it directly at the moment. I think we've got a very small exposure through regional managers. Yeah. Um, but it's been performing well. It's been one of the, you know, it's been a beneficiary um, of, the, of the US-China SPAC because obviously people looking to relocate their supply chains um, or diversify their supply chains. And Vietnam is... Is a kind of uh, you know, as I say, a classic frontier market story where you've got cheap labour, um, productive workforce, uh, and and you know that that is going to continue to be very attractive for a lot of companies globally. Yeah. So, but you know, frontier markets as a whole, Vietnam is one of them. It's one of the major ones, but you've got another thirty odd markets in the in the kind of frontier category. Uh, we've got about eight percent in total. Yeah, okay. Allocated across frontier How markets, define- mostly mostly through bonds. Yeah. How would you define a frontier market compared to an emerging market? So generally, and it is a sweeping generalization because there are some glaring anomalies to this yeah, definition. Okay. Um, but generally, you know, lower GDP per capita, smaller right. markets, less liquid, yeah. less mature. Right. Um, so so frontier markets, you know, the major ones of today are going to be the likes of Vietnam, Romania. Yeah. Uh, most of the African exchanges, excluding South Africa, so Egypt, um, Kenya, Nigeria, right, um, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Argentina, kind of drifts in and out of frontier markets and emerging markets, depending yeah. on whether it's having a good a good spell or a bad spell, um, and then a lot of the Middle Eastern markets, which have actually been you know promoted out of frontier and into emerging market in the last in the last few years. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're the obvious anomaly because they're, they've got, you know, very high GDP per capita, mm. but their their exchanges are still quite kind of fledgling. They've been around for a long time, but they're not necessarily um, that open to, to foreign investors. So they have to be investable as well. Yeah. Well, what, one thing which is might be an important factor for emerging market performance or certainly the economics is the dollar, because obviously it's weakened considerably since last year. And it seems as though given the Fed is going to run the economy hot, and we've seen Biden announcing a 1.9 million trillion uh, package, and then we've got a similar, I think, number coming for his infrastructure bill, and he's just on a spend, 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 you know, sort of like mandate at the moment, which is fine and dandy, but it's going to, it's going to weaken the currency. That's what the, sort of the, the logic is against most sort of like other currencies going forward. And presumably that should be very good for emerging markets because their dollar-denominated debt in real terms, is coming down against local currencies, and presumably it's going to give them a bit of a, 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 a sort of like a tailwind in terms of growth. On a thought, yeah, no, it's it's good for a for a host of reasons, mm. um, assuming it continues. And so you've had you've had a you've had a pronounced weakening kind of in the last year up to the kind of last couple of months when the dollar's gone sideways. Yeah, um, but that's that's been one of the reasons emerging markets have been performing pretty well in the last year. Um, The main impact, I would say, which is as a result of some of the things you just mentioned, is the flows. You know, if you've, you very simply put, if you've got a, if you invest in a country where the stock market is appreciating and the currency is appreciating, you get a, you get a lovely double whammy. Yeah, yeah. And that's basically what you've had from the S&P 500 for the last 10 years. Mm. So, you know, it's been the only game in town, the only place to be invested. Um, Other than your fund has actually beaten it. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Yeah, but over the last 10 years, over maybe the last not, 10 years, we definitely, yeah, okay. yeah, over the last 10 years, we've been, everything's lagged. Yeah, okay. You know, the S&P. Um, but as I say, if, if you think that the dollar is reaching a turning point, or at least is not going to get any stronger, then all of a sudden, you know, the return expectations for other asset classes can rise because you're not getting this really nasty translation effect. Yeah. Um, and, and there's two two broad camps in emerging markets. You know, you've got those mostly Asian currencies uh, dominated by the the renminbi, which have, mm. which have held their own. Now the US would say, well, that's because they're manipulating it. Mm. But actually, you know, we think the renminbi is kind of where it should be given the 
economy keeps growing and you know it's a big liquid currency and mm. you know, it's got lots of very positive things going for it the other basket would be your more traditional commodity energy plays and the kind of deficit countries where you know the sovereign balance sheet isn't as strong as you'd like it to be mm. so that's your your typical south africa turkey russia brazil i thought you were going to say Italy and, then <laughs> no well not, not an emerging market yet <laughs> Not an emerging market yet, um, but um, if you think if you think the dollar is plateauing or mm. even continues to weaken, then that would spell the end of a a ten year you know, trend yeah. that has been very very painful for a lot of emerging markets. It is very difficult to make a return in Brazil from Brazilian equities, no matter how well the local companies are doing in, yeah. in Brazilian real terms. If every time they translate their earnings back into dollars, they've got to account for another five, six, seven percent depreciation in the real. Mm. So, you know, uh, headwinds over the last decade could potentially turn to tailwinds in the next decade. I think if, if you get that kind of weaker dollar and you know, a lot of speculation at the moment around commodity and energy prices, are we in a new cycle? Then all of a sudden people can get very excited about the likes of Russia, Latin America, parts of Africa, the big commodity and energy exporters, because it should be good for their currencies. Mm -hmm. If you're investing in equities, which are performing you know, well in local currencies and you get a boost from the currency appreciation, then you know all of a sudden people like emerging markets a lot more, and when that happens, they're willing to allocate more of their their um, you know portfolios to those asset classes, and that becomes quite self fulfilling. Yeah. So that's what we had in the decade prior to the global financial crisis was you had emerging markets absolutely booming because you had appreciating equities, appreciating currencies, mm. you know, and 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 high yields on bonds. So you know lots of money flowing. And a lot of that's reversed over the last over the last ten years. What asset sort of like um, allocation are you doing? I know you've mentioned equities, you've mentioned bonds. I mean, what sort of percentage? And you know, do you do? I don't know pref shares and stuff like that. How, how, is it is it just basically those first two, or how, how do you sort of select? Um, we've we would we would be vast majority exposed to equities all the time. Okay. Um, I mean, we've got some gearing on the on the company, so so we're about we've got about six percent gearing. And yeah. we think a, ni a nice way to use that rather than just going and adding more equity, given what we said at the outset of this call, rather than just buying more equity, which can be volatile from time to time. You know, we've taken the decision to to allocate that gearing mostly to fixed income. Yeah. Okay. So so at the moment we 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 borrow at LIBOR plus I think 50 bips. Okay. And we allocate we allocate to um frontier market bonds, which yeah. are spread across 40 markets they're mostly hard currency bonds yeah but we receive a yield to maturity on those of, of over eight percent at right. the moment okay. nice and then we've and then we've got an allocation to chinese bonds yeah which is a mixture of corporate and sovereign bonds and we get a yield on those of between six and seven yeah so um and, and those returns should be very different to what we get from our china equities or our mm. russian equities or our african equities so it's it's quite complementary to what we earn yeah, it's a good. So that's about seven. That's about seven percent of our yeah and portfolio, where, but the vast majority is equities. Okay, and where else are sort of like your, you know, your sort of like your favourite places to to invest? You've mentioned obviously India and Russia in 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 country wise. You've also mentioned playing the carry trade essentially on the uh, on the bonds, which is giving you a nice pickup. Are you seeing any others on the say on the equities of of really good opportunities that you that you really like at the moment? So we're seeing we're seeing quite a few value opportunities now. That value is a bit of a dirty word at the moment, and it's been it's been underperforming, you mm -hmm. know, globally um, again for just, a very long time. Just look at my own about, uh, about, about, about ten years. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're, you know, that's been a headwind for us. Um, I, I think the important, I think our approach to to this is you know, avoid the extremes. So avoid the extremely frothy tech stuff you know we, we like growth but mm. we, we're not willing to pay 50 times sales. 20 28 earnings yeah, so, okay. or 20 28 sales yeah so so avoid that kind of extreme great you know some people will make loads of money doing that but we're not we're not comfortable that there's a margin of safety in doing that you avoid the very low quality stuff that looks like value at the other end and you know, state-owned enterprises and you know good chunk of financials um, but we do see a lot of very overlooked 
assets in out of the way markets mm. that are both very very good value mm. and and very high quality businesses and so um you know, a, a good example would be somewhere like Africa. So within our frontier market allocation, we've got exposed to African equities. And Africa has been, you know, one of the worst places you could have been allocated to for the last 10 years. You know, we took we took our exposure two or three years ago. So it's been painful, but it hasn't been, you know, that bad. But what we see um happening there is really just you know, orphaned assets. No no one's written about Africa for a long time. No one's yeah. investing in Africa. Yeah. You've seen a lot of fund flows actually out of Africa mm. from international investors who got excited about seven or eight years ago about Africa mm. and then left when you know the commodity complex rolled over and you had yeah. some issues with currencies. Um, so that we see as being really exciting now. And you know you can buy high quality companies Consumer companies, for example, brewery companies, um, infrastructure-related companies, telecom companies, you know, low single-digit price to earnings, EV to EBITDA, high yields, lots of cash generation. Mm. You know, those are the kind of stocks that aren't fashionable at the moment, but we're convinced at some point rationality is going to return and it's not just going to be all about unicorns and, and growth. Yeah. Um, you know, there is a place for, for stocks that are just quality compounders that have been overlooked and are undervalued. And, and so those are the kind of areas we're getting quite you know, excited about. We haven't done a huge amount about it yet, yeah. but certainly a lot of the indicators for when you know, value might come back into favour in some of those markets um, are starting, starting to turn, we think. I, I saw in your last investor note, you had a, um, a novel way of getting into um, Tencent, getting exposure to the Chinese gaming and IT company. Can you just quickly go through that? Because I, I never saw that before, but that's a really sort of like ingenious way of getting value and growth at a good price. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, a good, it's a good kind of anecdote about how we invest. Yeah. So, so we've, you know, classic kind of um, contrarian, call that we would make is we, one of our largest positions in China has been Fidelity China, which is mm -hmm. the, the London listed investment trust, which if yeah. you remember, you know, launched with much fanfare managed by Anthony Bolton. Um, oh, of course. And yes. Yeah. So crashed and burned, didn't they? Or crashed and yeah. burned. So, you know, we watched, we didn't participate in IPO. We watched it rally to a nice yeah. premium to NAV. And then, you know, when he had some hiccups in the portfolio and a couple of corporate governance issues, you watch, um, you know, the discount emerge, and, and the discount peaked at about twenty percent. Um, and at that time as well, which was almost ten years ago, you know, China was not somewhere people wanted to be invested. It was still very much off the radar and mm. viewed very suspiciously by most investors. So we were accumulating shares back then. Mm. Um, Dale Nichols, the current manager, comes in. He's done a fantastic job in the last ten years. Great performance. Really leveraged the. Um, the closed end fund structure using gearing and, and you know buying small caps and, and and delivering performance that way um you know fast forward 10 years it's now back to trading at nav or a small premium yeah so rather serendipitously at the same time as we were you know harvesting some of that position and we still rate the manager and still own a large position in it but we we certainly took some off the top um, we saw an opportunity to buy NASPAS, which is South African listed company. It's the largest company on the South Africa on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange by a long way. Um, it accounts for, I think, about a third of the index. Right. Um, and that's a holding company, but but their main asset is a stake that they bought many years ago in Tencent. Um, you know, for pennies. Brilliant. And um, and they've ridden it the whole way up, so it, it accounts for about ninety percent of their assets. Yeah. Um, and yet the holding company trades at a, over a 50% discount to you know, a sensible NAV if you go out and calculate one. So there's many reasons for why that holding, count, holding company discount exists. Yeah. Um, we think there's a good number of reasons why it might narrow um, because management, you know, if nothing else, management are quite aligned with investors. They, they have taken tentative measures to reduce the discount, which haven't necessarily worked. So we think there's going to be more, more coming. Um, but as a way to kind of sell out of a Chinese asset that's played out and get into another one that's really at quite an exciting stage, you know, we think, we think it's a very interesting way to do it. 
Oh, and yeah. again, something something that would be difficult for you know most people in the UK to access. I think, although there is a European holding company as well, which is it's part of the same complex. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's just absolutely fabulous because essentially what you're doing is you're buying a high growth internet stock for half the price. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. So, and, and so and when, you know, we like to have both. In an ideal world, you'd yeah, have growth and value. Exactly. And that's always the way. So I think that's where you said about asset allocation, the places that excite us are where we can yeah. get that growth without having to pay an awful lot of money for it. Yeah. And then, and then just sort of like, just finally, I mean, if, if any investors want to sort of like get their cake and eat it, like you have on naps on Nasdaq and Tencent, where would be the best place to, um, to sort of like contact? If they want to put some money into the, um, the, the Aberdeen standard emerging markets funds, you can contact you or go to the website or just go on their platform. Uh, yeah. Go, go, go to the website. Uh, you know, it's London listed. So um, you can, oh, course, you can buy yeah. it through any, you can buy it through any platform. Um, and the ticker is AEMC. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's very simple. You know? And um, as I say, we, you know, we're very happy. The reason, one of the reasons we've been around for 20 years plus is that it is a closed end fund. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's still the right structure for emerging markets, given the volatility that we said, you know, long-term great returns, but it, it really helps if you don't get outflows at those, um, at those panic moments, um, right. which will inevitably happen from yeah. time to time. Yeah. Um, so I th- we still think a closed end structure is a great way to you know, access emerging markets. And, Not like uh, Neil Woodford. <laughs> no, well, no comment. Exactly. Yeah, that was a, a, another crash of birth. But yeah, anyway, thanks very but much. Thank, thankfully for every Woodford, there's, you know, there's 50 or 100 other investment trusts that are doing an extremely good job. Yeah. And I would just highlight to investors, I mean, I just re- re- repeat it, over the last 20 years, from peak to peak, I mean, you know, the FTSE's gone up 2.5%. You know, S and P one hundred and seventy five percent, the Nasdaq one hundred, sorry, three hundred and sixty five percent, and then your fund is up four hundred and twenty percent. I mean, that just says everything. You might get extra volatility, but if you've got a long term view, the direction of travel has, and hopefully, albeit you can never say for history is is a good projector of performance. But you know, if you look at the line, it's upwards. So, uh, congrats on the on the performance there, Andrew. And uh, thank you very much. Really look forward to chatting again going forward. Yeah, no, thanks, Paul. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks, thanks, everyone, for listening. Cheers.